Well, hello and welcome to Tuesday Night Live with Pastor Don Clowers, and I'm his co-host, Pastor Al. And uh, as you can see, our host, Pastor Don, is not here this evening, <clears throat> but don't turn us off just yet. Give us an opportunity. We're going to bring something to you tonight that's going to really be a blessing. I believe it's going to really be a blessing. But Pastor Don and Pastor Sharon and David, all the Clowers, not all of them, but those three, are pastors and uh, Brother David Clowers, our, I guess you'd call David our chief technician uh, in our audio video department, but he's away. But we got our faithful uh, standbys, but they're not just standbys, they're here to, to help us all the time, Danielle and Josh. So they're in the control room tonight, and we have a few of our folks here with us in the, in the chapel. And we're all going to be worshiping God together and praising God together and rejoicing around the Word of God. Now, Pastor Don will be back Sunday, so don't worry about that. He'll be back speaking, I think, continuing his series on the love of God this Sunday. Easter Sunday, we have a, a real surprise. I get to hear Pastor Sharon Clowers, whom I've never heard, so I'm excited about that and anticipating a great, great Easter Sunday. If you don't have any plans, you should come out here and be with us at Experience Life Church right here on Fairway Drive. Uh, I tell people when they say, well, where is that? I said, do you know where the Waffle House is on Hebron Parkway? I'm surprised at how many people know where the Waffle House is. <laughs> and I said, well, all you got to do is just come right behind the Waffle House. And we're not in a big church building. We're in an office complex right in the middle. You can't miss us. Just come to the middle, and there you'll see our Experience Life Church sign, just like the one that we've got here behind us. If I get out of the way, there you go. And you'll see that at the front door. And you will be greeted by some of the friendliest people you have ever met in all of your life. And they'll treat you like kings and queens. They'll show you to your seat. They'll just take care of you like you were a baby. And if you don't like that, just tell us how you want to be treated. And that's the way we'll treat you. Except we won't treat you mean. So if you're used to being treated mean, this is not a good place for you to come. We love everybody and we like to treat everybody like Jesus treats people. So remember those announcements, and uh, we're going to jump right into this. And the reason I'm at the pulpit tonight is I felt like I could be a little bit more expressive, and also I could see my notes a little bit better from here than I can on a flat table. And, uh, you know, if, you've, if you follow us on the Internet, then you've already seen the announcement for uh, this evening's webcast, and the subject material is where does God dwell? Where is God's dwelling place? God's dwelling place. Now, we already know that the Bible says this. The Bible says that uh, heaven is his throne, God's throne, and the earth is his footstool. So we serve a big God. Uh, when uh, big John Hall was here, he sang that song, a great, big, wonderful God a God that's always victorious, and he's always watching over us. He's a great, big, wonderful God. Our God is omnipotent. Our God is omniscient. Our God is omnipresent. You just cannot get any bigger than Jehovah God. He is God. You, you know, I remember the statement that Pharaoh made when uh, all the plagues, they had suffered through all the plagues in Egypt, and his heart was still hard. But, you know, those plagues convinced Pharaoh of one thing. Because he had his soothsayers, he had his magicians, he had his so-called prophets and seers. But uh, they just didn't know what to do with the awesome power of Jehovah God. And finally, Pharaoh said, Moses' is God is God. See, when you follow, you can, listen, you can go look at all the religions of the world. You can look at all the so-called prophets, all the so-called, you know, mighty men of this world. And then when you compare any of those to Jesus Christ, to Almighty God, they pale in comparison. Because our God is God. Our God is God. Now, I want you to, if you haven't already done it, I want you to call a friend, a neighbor, a family member, 
and tell them to tune in the webcast because we're going to talk about God's dwelling place. Where in the world does God live? If heaven is his throne, if earth is his footstool, then, you know, he's awesome. He's, he's a word we used to use when I was growing up was humongous. You know, so that's humongous. God is humongous. He, actually, the Bible says that our God is too awesome to describe. They're, they're not words really to describe the awesomeness, the holiness, the grandeur of our God. So call somebody and tell them, hey, if, you, if you've been wondering where does God live, where does God dwell, where is God's dwelling place, tune in. Pastor Al is talking about it right now on elglobal.church. Call somebody, share this right now. Just go and if you're watching us on Facebook, just go and, and touch share and you can share this webcast tonight with all of your friends and I believe that you'll be glad you shared it because I believe God has got something special for us this evening. All right, mankind lives in two realms. Two realms. We live, first of all, in a physical realm which is in bodies made of, of earthen material, like we have sinew and we have uh, flesh and we have skin and we have bones that make up our bodies. And so we, we live in a physical realm because we live in these bodies. But we also inhabit a spiritual realm. We have a soul. We have a spirit. Now, in both of these realms, our growth and our survival depend on proper nourishment, appropriate nourishment. Now, the feeding of our physical bodies is usually not an issue, right? I mean, we get hungry, we eat. Uh, we, we, we say, well, you know, I'm hungry, I got to go and feed the, the uh, physical body. I got to go and feed the old guy, the young guy, or whatever. I've got to feed myself some, some physical food. But the feeding of our souls, when it comes to the feeding of our souls and the feeding of our spirits, sometimes we encounter malnourishment. We really do. Because, you know, it, it just seems that, that we don't feed our spirits enough for our spirit man to grow into maturity. Now, I'm going to say some things tonight that I hope don't upset you, unless you need to be upset. You know, sometimes we need some things upsetting the apple cart to just push us out of the status quo because the same old, same old produces the same old, same old. And I don't know about you, but there's some times that God puts obstacles or things in my way just to get me out of the rut that I might be in. Sometimes we're in a rut, we don't realize it. Now, I'm talking to religious people right now. Well, maybe not. Uh, I'm talking to Christian people. <laughs> you can be religious and not be a Christian. Be religious and not be saved. But sometimes we Christians can get in a rut and, and we get in what I call a, a rut of comfort. We, we're comfortable where we are. Some of us go to the church we attend and we always sit in the same seat. Uh, we always speak to the same people. Now in our church, we speak to everybody because we're not real large. But in, in these mega churches, there's no way, there's no way to go in and speak to thousands of people. So we kind of cultivate our little circles of fellowship, and that's fine. That's what you have to do. But it, it, it seems that we, we forget about how God wants us to get out of our comfort zone. He wants us to get out of the same old, same old. And I'm going to get to this in a moment in, in the book of Hebrews. But before I get there, I want to say when we encounter malnourishment, that's what I'm talking about as a Christian. When we encounter malnourishment and we are, are not feeding our spirit man enough. Remember, remember what Paul said? Paul said, though our outward man, our, our, our bodies, our outward bodies perish. Yet this inward man, Paul said, listen, the physical man, let him perish because he's in a perishable container, in a body. He said, but the inner man, the inward man must be renewed on a daily basis. People say, well, I was in church Sunday. Well, did you just eat one meal physically last week? Probably not. You know, we, we can't hardly survive if we don't eat at least what they call three square meals a day. 
We say, well, I've got to have, I, I've got to have something to eat. I, I, I don't want to starve myself to death. <laughs> and, and in America, it's not likely that we're going to starve. But we are very intent on feeding the, the physical man, on feeding the natural man. And Paul knew that. And he said, listen, if we're so preoccupied with this body, with this natural man, uh, don't be that preoccupied. He said, that, that old man, that, that body is perishing. But the inward man that's going to be eternal, you need to put some focus, some emphasis on that inner man. Now you say, well, Pastor Al, what, what in the world has that got to do with where God dwells? We're getting there. We're getting there. We're just getting started. So uh, I, I want to say this, though. Uh, God showed his desire to dwell with man in the Garden of Eden, if you want to go back to that story. Because God came every day into the Garden to fellowship with Adam and Eve every day. God didn't have to do that. But see, God created man to be with man. He wanted to be with his creation. And I see God in a lot of things. I believe God dwells in the mountains. God dwells in the lakes. God dwells in the seas. God dwells in the plants. God dwells in the flowers and the trees. This time of year, the beauty of God is just bursting out all over. And, and, and when seasons change, you know, in the fall, the colors burst out speaks about God. The Bible says the sun, the moon, the stars, all of creation speak about God. In other words, God is saying, here I am. Here I am. I'm in the sun. I'm in the moon. I'm in the stars. I'm in the sky. I'm in the vegetation. You know, Brother Al, sometimes when I'm riding around, traveling around, even this world under a curse is absolutely beautiful. I mean, it blows my mind. Sometimes I stood in Niagara Falls some years ago. And I looked out at the grandeur of Niagara Falls, the beauty, the natural beauty, the, the thundering noise of the falls as it cascades over Niagara Falls. And I stood there and I thought, Lord, you are awesome. I, I, I reserve the word awesome, as you all know, for things that relate to God. Because as I said to someone once, well, my sister-in-law, she may be watching tonight. If you are marrying, God bless you. But she's always saying everything's awesome. You know, she say, that cookie was awesome. That cake was awesome. And if I'm there, I'll say, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It might have been wonderful. It might have been tasty. It might have been the best cookie, the best cake you've ever eaten. But it was not awesome. I said, you know why I say that? Because our God is awesome. And I cannot relate God to a cookie. I cannot relate God to a slice of pie or a slice of cake because my God is awesome. Yeah. And tonight, before we get finished with this webcast, at the end, we're going to pray for everyone who wants to discover where God dwells and participate with God in his dwelling place. Now, let, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 6. I'm just going to turn there right now. Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 6. And I'm reading from the King James Version. Now I may switch back and forth between the King James Version and the, the Living Bible. I like to do that. I have a parallel Bible with both the King James and the Living Bible. Those are my two favorite uh, translations. But hey, I'm sure you have your own as long as it doesn't veer away from the original Bless you. Read it. Study it. It'll do you good. But in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 5, it says, For when you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. And here's what God said. You have need to be taught again the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he or she is a baby. Somebody said, I don't like that. I know I didn't like it either when I began to study the word of God and, and I found out I was a baby. You know, I don't want to be a spiritual baby all my life. And I want to say this just to, to plant this seed in your mind when we're talking about the, the dwelling place of God. God is not available to casual seekers. 
You've heard me say that before, and you'll hear me say it often. God is not available to casual seekers. The Bible tells us that we will find Him when we search for Him with how much of our heart? All of our heart. God doesn't want any partial obedience. He wants full obedience. He does not want any partial passion, a little bit of your passion. God wants you to be fully passionate about your relationship with Him, about your fellowship with Him, about your love for Him. Let's go on here. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness because he's a baby, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised both good and evil. Now let's just jump over here to the Living Bible. And it says, you have been Christians a long time now. I'm talking to people tonight. If you want to know where God dwells, I said he doesn't, he doesn't dwell. Uh, he's not found by the casual seeker. He's found by the diligent searcher. You're not just going to stumble into the word of God and find God there by doing this. Mm, Lord, let me find something here. And, you know, if you do, it's an accident. Somebody said, the Holy Spirit led me. No, he didn't. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead you into the Word of God that way. It may have happened to you, and you may have gotten a blessing, but that is not the way God wants you to study his Word. He doesn't want you to have a promise box on your table, and every day you draw out a promise box. Do that. It's not, it's not harmful. It's not going to hurt you. But if all you uh, eat on is what you consider the, the precious promises or the promises that make you feel good or the promises that stroke your flesh and, and make you feel better. Somebody said, well, I, I want to read the Word of God so I'll feel better. You know what? Sometimes I read the Word of God and I feel worse. You know why? Because it cut on me. It pruned me. The Bible said even if we bear fruit, we're going to be pruned. Why? Because God said, I want you to bear, bear more fruit. He doesn't want you to, uh, if you're an apple tree, to have one or two apples. He wants your tree to be filled with apples or oranges or figs or whatever fruit tree that, that you envision yourself to be. But he wants us to bear fruit. And, and, and God wants to indwell a productive saint of God. God wants to take you places where you've never been. I'm talking about in the Word of God. I'm talking about to Hawaii. And I've never been to Hawaii, but you know, it'd be nice to go. But I'd rather God take me places in here than to take me places geographically. I'd rather God lead and guide me, and He will. How do we know that, saints? Because He said, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, that's the Holy Spirit, he, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, will lead you and guide you into how much truth? All truth. All truth. Someone says, well, you know, what's truth to you may not be truth to me. Listen, truth is truth. And if it's truth to me, it's truth to everybody. Amen. You know, so, well, that's not today's, I don't care what today's culture is. I, God did not call me to appease those who are culture seekers or culture pleasers. As a matter of fact, when I was growing up, it seemed to me that the Christian doctrine, the Christian belief, those of us who really had a hold of the Holy Spirit, were always seeming to go the opposite way of the world. Somebody said, well, it's still that way. Well, maybe it is, and maybe it isn't in all places. I see many uh, so-called Christians today they say they are believers, but they don't seem to talk like a believer. They don't often act like a believer. And I'm going to say something that may upset somebody. Some people don't look like believers. <laughs> so I said, oh, pastor, please. Now, let's don't get on this deal about, you know, holy, uh, long hymns. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about looking like Christ. How do we do that? Uh, Pastor uh, Don preached the other Sunday, what does love look like? And he gave us a lot of points, but basically we could condense it and say love looks like God because God is love. We used to sing a song. I wanted to sing it the other week. 
but I hadn't gotten with Rosa when we talk about love. And, and this, this song says, he loves you when you're right. Yes, he loves you when you're wrong. Wow. He loves you when you're weak and when you're strong. He'll never, ever change. He's every day the same because God is God and God is love. God is love eternally, the song says. The Bible tells me so. Proven at dark Calvary, his matchless love to show. See, God's already proven his love. He sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have life, what kind of life? Everlasting, Everlasting eternal life. We cannot die. Did you know I'm never going to die? Amen. I am never going to die. I say, well, oh, you know, we'll remind you of that or we'll tell your family about it when we march by your casket. Tell them whatever you want to because I won't be there. <laughs> my body, which we started out talking about, my body may be lying in that coffin or in that casket, but to be absent from my body, we'll get to this in a few minutes, is to be present with the Lord. Now, I'm going to say something again. I, I didn't come tonight to upset everybody, but if I say some things that make you think more deeply, then I've accomplished my purpose. Uh, I, I don't want to be the same tomorrow as I am right now. I don't. I want to be different. I want to be more Christ-like. I may not succeed, but I want to be. That is my goal. You see, some people don't want to set a goal. They're happy with the way they are. I talk to Christians all the time. They say, you know what? I'm just really happy with my experience in God. I said, I can understand what you mean. I can understand what you're saying. But, you know, I want more of it. We sing about it. We'll sing more of you. More of you. I want, you know, I want more of you. I've had it all. But what I really need or want is more of you. And then the song says, of things I've had in my fill, but yet I hunger still. Why is that? Because things do not satisfy the spiritual man. Things only satisfy the flesh. Things satisfy the natural man. You know, when I was a kid, I'm a roller coaster guy. When you go to the, to the amusement parks, I line up for all the coasters. I don't care if I ride anything else. I want to ride all the coasters that are there. Now, that's when I was a young man. Uh, a few years ago, Linda and I went back to Six Flags over Georgia, which we had practically raised our kids there because we lived within bicycle ride of Six Flags over Georgia, and our, both of our kids had season passes, and we were always at Six Flags over Georgia. I rode the screen machine. I rode all the coasters. I uh, rode the runaway mine train, the Dahlonega mine train, uh, uh, you know, uh, runaway mine train. If you've ever been to Georgia, Dahlonega, Georgia, is where they, they mined the gold that they put on top of the capital in Atlanta. It's actually real gold that that, that capital dome is covered with. Now, I don't know how many carats, probably not too many. <laughs> but th they named this, uh, this uh, mine train, as they called it, the runaway mine train, and it was a real rough ride. And I'd always get on there when I was young. I loved it. I'd ride with my hands up. I'd ride on the screen machine with your hand. You know, got to be dangerous when you ride with your hands up. And, uh, but we got on that day, and I tell you, we weren't even there a half a day. We weren't there till noon until I was looking at Linda, and I said, you know what, honey? I think I've had my fill of, of six flags today. Uh, it, it, my body just wasn't adjusting the same way that it always did when I got so thrilled. But even during the days that I got thrilled, after I rode the screen machine or the Dahlonega runaway mine train or whatever thrilling ride it was, I'd get off and go right back around and get in the line again. Why? It didn't fulfill me, only for the moment. For the moment, I was exhilarated. For the moment, I was excited. But it did not last. What I'm telling you, watching over the internet tonight, I'm telling you that whatever you've been trying to, to get fulfillment from, and you, you, you have to keep going back to the well to draw that water again, like the woman in the scripture. You know, she came to draw water, and Jesus asked her for a drink. And, and he said, well, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink. And she looked at him and she said, sir, you don't even have a bucket. 
What are you even hanging around the well for? You don't have anything to draw with. What kind of water are you going to give me? And he said, the water that I give you, you won't get thirsty no more. Uh, he was talking about a whole different water and a completely different thirst. She was talking about this physical body we started out with. She was talking about this natural thirst we started out with. Jesus was talking about that spiritual man. That, that spiritual man that the Apostle Paul said, we need to, to nourish him or her every single day. There don't need to be a day goes by that you do not fellowship with your maker. That you do not fellowship with your creator. That you do not, I love to fellowship with God. I don't need anybody there, just me and God. As a matter of fact, I like it better that way. I like to fellowship God. Maybe I'm selfish. I didn't realize it, you know. But when other people there, sometimes they, I lose my focus. And I'm either listening to them pray or watching what they're doing. But when it's just me and God, I love to fellowship with him. The old song said, friendship with Jesus, fellowship divine. Oh, how blessed this sweet communion. Jesus is a friend of mine. How many know he's your friend? Jesus is a friend, and he wants to be a close friend. He said he is a friend that sticks how close? Closer than a brother. My brother and I were close, but you know, Jesus and I are closer. <laughs> we are closer. Now let's go back to this Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 6, because I left you with verses 12, 13, and 14 from chapter 5, that says when you ought to be a teacher yourself, you still need to be taught. And you need to be taught the first principles. And you need milk, which is infant food, baby food. He said, and not strong meat, because if you use milk, you're unskillful. In other words, it's, it's okay. You, you, there has to be a time in your life as a believer that you need milk, but not when you've been a Christian for 50 years. Not when you've been a Christian for five years. Somebody said, well, you know, I'm just a new believer. And I've only been a Christian five years. And they're still <laughs> thumb sucking and, and uh, pablum eating. Uh, they're still a baby. You know, you're, you're, listen, every one of you who had children, your child hopefully wasn't still a thumb circuit when he was five. If he was, you, you should have broke him from that long time before he was five or she was five. I, both of our children love the pacifier. I never have understood that because there's nothing in it. There's nothing in a pacifier. And yet a lot of Christians I know suck them. Oh, pastor, please don't. Listen, don't you know a lot of Christians, a lot of believers, really they go around with a thumb in their mouth all the time. They're always offended. They always got their feelings hurt. They need hands laid on them every Sunday. They need a word of prophecy every Sunday. They, need, they always need something. When, when is the church of Jesus Christ going to reach a place where it's not so needy and can go out and meet needs of people that really are needy? Yeah. Those that are lost without God, they're needy. Those that are sick in sin, they're sin sick. They need to be rescued. But we are so, uh, you know, Christians, so many of us have to be pacified all the time and, and keep our bottles filled and our, and our pablum handy for us and our little, you know, chew toys there, because we're still teething, some of us don't, don't have enough teeth to, to eat strong meat. And this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. And then he goes on in verse 6 and says, Therefore, he's still talking. This is a continuation of, uh, of chapter 5. He says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And he's going to list them. He says, Leaving those, let us go on unto perfection, which is a word here uh, for maturity. Because we're not going to be perfect till that which is perfect has come. But we can be mature. Now, how many Christians do you know, don't, please don't shout me down, who are immature? How many Christians do you know who are still sucking their thumb or eating their pablum? Or every time you see them, they're crying like a baby. They've got to be consoled. Now, as a pastor, some, I know somebody's probably saying, I'm sure glad you're not my pastor. I, I, I hope I, I was never in your flock. Well, you should talk to those who were in my flock. Uh, I loved my sheep, and my sheep loved me because I cared for them. But that doesn't mean I spoiled them. 
If we're not careful, we can spoil the flock. By always, hey, listen, did you always give your children everything they asked for? I don't know. Some people say, well, I try to give my kids everything I didn't have. Why? You made it all right, didn't you? I mean, I grew up and my dad would, would have been called upper middle class. I never knew what it was to need anything. I had plenty of food. I had all the clothes. I mean, I, I wasn't extravagant, but my mom made sure I had what I needed. And my dad. And they took care of me. They were great parents. They were wonderful providers. But they didn't just provide me with food and, and raiment and uh, the material, natural things that I needed as, as a, a child growing up. They also provided me spiritual nourishment. They made sure they took me to church. My parents never sent me to church. I was never sent. I was taken. Sometime by the nap of the neck because I didn't want to go. I wasn't always a willing participant at worship because I wasn't saved. I was not born again at the time. And so when my parents said, we're going to the house of God, a lot of times I was thinking, I wish there was some other house I could go to while you go to the house of God. You see, because I didn't have that fervent love that I'm talking about. I didn't have that, that fervency, that passion that drove me into God. And that's what I want to see in every believer. I want to see us get off of that pablum. You know, throw away the pacifier. I remember, I think it was our daughter Renee that just did not want to give up her, her, her passy, she called it. And, and we tried everything. I'm sure you think we were cruel because we put hot sauce on it. Because somebody told us if you put hot sauce on it, they'll never want it again. Well, th that didn't work. That didn't work. She just sucked the hot sauce off and got on back down to her pacifier. But what we did is, is we, we took it to the toilet and we put it in and flushed it and waved bye-bye to it. You know, I, I believe some of us uh, pastors and spiritual parents need to take some of our parishioners or some believers uh, that, that's thumb-sucking their whole life and, 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 and on that pacifier seems like forever uh, let's take them to, I don't, I, there probably is no such thing as a spiritual toilet, but let's take them to, to a place where we can drop that pacifier like we did in, in the commode in the toilet and wave bye-bye, and she actually saw it swirl around and disappear. And every time she would ask for it after that, we'd say, gone. You saw it, gone. It's gone. We, it's not, it don't exist anymore. It's gone. And finally, she got the connection I don't need to ask for that anymore because it's gone. As long as we serve up the milk and the pablum and the pacifiers and provide for spiritual babies, they're going to be babies all their life. But there, there comes a time, I remember back during, I think I, I was sharing this with Pastor Don uh, not too long ago in a conversation. I said, you know, there was a time when I was growing up in, in, uh, in my church as a young Christian that everybody uh, was accustomed to getting a word of personal prophecy when they went to church. It was just what, what happened back then. And so as a young believer, I became very dependent. And when I went to church, I sat there waiting, expecting uh, my word of prophecy. And it was always, you know, one of them, yea, I say unto thee, you're a really good boy. We love those kind of words, don't we? When God tells us how wonderful we are, how great we are, how... how and there's nothing wrong with that. But there come a time when I went to my pastor and I was very upset. And I said, you know, everybody in our church is having dreams and visions. And, and everybody in our church is just, they seem to be having some kind of supernatural experience. But me, I'm not having it. And I, I pointed out and said to her, well, well sister so-and-so, I know I'm just as holy as she is. Or brother so-and-so, I think I walk just as close to God as he does. And he was up last Sunday talking about his vision and his dream. And she said, son, I want you after the service, come in my office. And you and I are going to have a chat. And she sat me down, looked across her desk at me, and she said, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I believe in everything that our people are talking about. I believe God can visit in dreams. I believe God can uh, give visions. I believe God can do all of these things. She said, but son, let me, let me tell you this. If you can live your life with God, if you can grow up in God, 
on nothing but the pure Word of God. You'll be stronger than the vision. You'll be stronger than the dream. You'll be stronger than the one that is dependent upon all of these surface things because you have decided to go make your life mission getting into the Word of God and knowing the God of the Word. Knowing the God of the Word is the key, saints. I'm telling you, knowing the God of the Word. And, and, and let me just finish these, these three verses here in the sixth chapter of Hebrews. Leaving the principles, going on into maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance. In other words, you shouldn't have to repent all the time. You should repent and have that stone laid. Know that you're saved, that you're born again, that you're blood washed. He said, don't, don't have to go back to repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. I mean, Hebrew says without faith it is impossible to please God. We must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I believe that. But here God is saying, look, you need to go on past that. That's in the first principles. That's still in infancy. That's still in spiritual childhood. And then he says, of the doctrines of baptisms. Now, now this next one's going to upset somebody. And laying on of hands. Of the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands. You know, some folks can't go to church without getting hands laid on. They, they, they're unhappy if the service is dismissed and, and pastor or a fellow member or somebody didn't lay hands on them. When Brother T.F. Lim was here, he may be watching tonight. If he is, hello, T.F. He's just been in Hong Kong and doing great things for God. We love him. But we were talking, having a conversation when he was here, and we were talking about this. I said, you know, we need to get to a point where as born-again believers, full of the Holy Spirit, mature in God, grown up in God, not afraid of the devil, not, not, not afraid of the enemy one bit. I never get up in my walk with God in the mornings and say, well, I sure hope I don't run into the devil today. I hope I do run into it. You know, uh, rather, I uh, hope he runs into me. Don't, don't, wouldn't you love it? Uh, I think somebody who we had recently speaking here, I believe they made this statement. They said, you know, we, we want the devil to say every morning when we get up, oh no, he's up again, or oh no, she's up again. Wouldn't that be great? And, and I believe that there are those of us that the devil says that. I do. I believe he says, oh my goodness, here's someone I can't handle. Here's someone I cannot discourage. Here's someone I cannot put fear into their heart. Here's someone I cannot defeat. That person I cannot defeat. I had some people tell me one time when I said I cannot be defeated, rebuke me after church. They came up to me and said, you shouldn't make statements like that, that you cannot be defeated. <laughs> I said, well, we sing it. We'll not be defeated. We'll not be defeated. We sing it. We'll not be defeated anymore. Since the Holy Ghost came in, gave us power over sin, we'll not be defeated. And we sung that in our church. And they come up and say, well, you shouldn't say that you can't be defeated. I said, we just got through singing it. If you sung it and you don't believe it, you lied. You sung a lie. We can sing a lie as well as tell a lie. Be careful, a little uh, mouth, what you say. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. And be careful, little eyes. Remember singing that song? We need sanctified ears, sanctified eyes, and a sanctified mouth set aside for God so that God can dwell in us. Now, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but let me just say this, and then I'll leave uh, these verses and go into what I call the wrapping up part. Of this, we got a few minutes left, so we're gonna we're gonna go on and try to tie all of the loose ends together. It says about all these doctrines, and it went ahead and listed the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. It says these are things that ought to be cemented in our life. These are things we ought to know. It's like laying a foundation. This is called the foundation. And God said, you know, once you've laid the foundation, you go back and lay it again. You build on it. You build on it. The reason some of us have never built anything in God is because we keep having to lay the foundation again of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, the resurrection. We keep having to be taught the first principles over and over again. And, and, and sometimes I'll say, I'll say to my wife or I'll say to other uh, believers that I know or grown up in God, 
And I'll say to them, when are we going to see the church rise up? We sing about it. We sing about rising up, rising up. But when are we going to do it and not just sing about it? When are we going to rise up and overcome uh, those things the enemy is throwing in, into our pathway? I mean, I, I, I arrived at Texas Hospital today at 1 o'clock. And at 4.30, I was still there. And uh, I was concerned because I knew I had to be here for the webcast this evening. And so when I looked on my phone to see how long it was going to take me to get from uh, the hospital to home, it said 58 minutes. Well, I thought, well, it's going to be 5.30 before I get home. I'm supposed to be here at 6.30, and we go on the air at 7. So I'm r rustling about, you know, trying, and I think I finally got home and, and got my clothes changed and got everything together <laughs> and went off and left my notes on the table, and my wife had to hurriedly jump in the car and rush them over here. Wilson had to go out and get them and bring them in, and they finally got them to me just before we were going on the air. So you, you don't know any of that. <laughs> Somebody said, well, you know, you had this well planned. Yes, it was well planned. I've been studying and thinking about what I was going to say for about a week, uh, ever since I knew I was going to be taking this service and pastor I was going to be away. But uh, I would have much rather been here at 630 meditating, contemplating, rerunning some things through my mind. And that's why I believe that David made the statement he made. When David said, thy word is hidden in my heart, I hid it there so that I might not sin against God. I'm not going to sin against God because I got the word in me that, that keeps me from it. I didn't say that I was incapable of sin or incapable of failure. But I want to tell you what. I don't do it on purpose. Somebody told me, they said, I lost my temper today. I said, no, you didn't. You found it. You don't ever lose it. We find it. And when we find it, we display it. And then we say, well, I lost my temper. No, you found your temper. Uh, but it's okay to have a temper. Jesus had a temper. Jesus uses and exercised his temper. The Bible says, be angry, but don't sin. You can be angry without sinning. But it's where you focus, where you put that anger. What, where do you use it? And who do you use it on? It's all, all right to be angry with the devil. It's all right to be angry with uh, sickness and disease. It, it's all right to be angry with poverty and homelessness. Be angry. Be stirred up. But then do something about it. Don't just feel bad about it. But, but put some actions, uh, you know, behind your thoughts. Now, before I, I read any more verses, I want to I go back to this point right here. I mentioned earlier, I haven't forgotten about the dwelling place of God, God's dwelling place. And I said that, that God showed his desire to dwell with man in the Garden of Eden by coming every day to fellowship with Adam and Eve in the Garden. God gave Moses a blueprint for the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was a, a portable sanctuary where God would dwell among his people. The Bible said he dwelt perpetually which means 24 hours around the clock, God was there. He didn't take any time off, any days off, any minutes off, any seconds off. God dwelt perpetually, always, in the tabernacle because he wanted to dwell among his people. And here's what God actually said. He said, I want to dwell in their midst. I want to be right in the middle of them. Wherever we are, wherever God's people, wherever the church collects itself, God said, I want to be there. And I want to be right in the midst of my people. Not just when two or three are gathered together. Uh, but, but that's just letting, God letting us know, even when it's just a, a, a two or three, just a handful. God said, there am I. There am I. So you don't have to wait and say, well, unless we have a full house or we've got all our seats filled. You know, it's just not the same. It is the same. If you realize that the presence of God, God wants you to be in his presence. Now, God's continual presence, here's what the scripture teaches us. God's continual presence would distinguish his people from all other people. God's presence, and still should be the same today. God's presence should distinguish us from all other people on planet earth. And finally, we come to 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that says, don't you know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? 
Don't you know that your body, somebody touch your body and say, this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, this ain't no junk. This is a temple that God hallows uh, and, and, and knows it's so important he created it that he will come and dwell in this temple that we call our body. And it says, after it says that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you? Everybody say, he's in me. And it says, whom you have received from God. Where did the Holy Spirit come from? It came from God. He says, you are not your own. Uh-oh. Oh, you know, not, most of us don't like that. Say, don't tell me I'm not my own. I know I'm my own. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. See, we, that's, that's the culture today. I'm me. I gotta be me. <laughs> who else could I be but who I am? You could be who God wants you to be. You could be the vessel that God wants you to be. He says, you were bought with a price. That's why you're not your own. You've been purchased. Yeah. Children of God, you have been purchased at a price. And so, he says, honor God with your bodies, which is his temple. Now, I knew I'd, I'd upset somebody before the final amen. <laughs> Do you think that putting a tattoo on your body is honoring God? I didn't say God didn't love people with tattoos. That's not what I said. Because he does. My son's got lots of them. And he's a preacher. But he didn't get them with my blessing. Because I believe the scripture is very important. Our bodies are temples. And I believe that we ought to hallow them. If you ever go to Jerusalem, and you ever go to uh, the Dome of the Rock, which is right now not occupied by the Jewish people, but by the Muslim people. When you get up near there, you have to take your shoes off. They make you. You take your shoes off and pile them up. You don't wear your shoes in there because they hallow that Dome of the Rock. You are not allowed to touch the opposite sex, even if it's your wife, your spouse. Once you get within a certain uh, footage of that Dome of the Rock, they have uh, guards that'll come around because and, and, I know I had my arm around my wife. We were talking. They came up and just removed my arm and took it down off of my wife's shoulders because they say, this is a holy place. We don't want you to think about anything except the Prophet Muhammad and Allah. Now, that's Muslims. Shouldn't we honor God, the real God, Jehovah God, the awesome God, more than the Muslims honor the Prophet Muhammad and Allah? Because they're not the same. See, some people say, oh, pastor, see, we got movements today, and I got to hurry. We got movements today uh, that are trying to call, they're trying to combine Christianity and Islam and call it Chrislam. That's ridiculous. Chrislam. You cannot unite Islam and Christianity. They do not mix. It's like oil and water. And yet we got people today, I mean, they, I'm talking about big pastors, well-known worldwide that are pushing Chrislam because they say we have got to, to, to become one. One in what? One in Allah, not me. One in Confucius, not me. One in Buddha, not me. One in Muhammad, no, no. One in Allah, no, not me. I serve the Lord Christ. I serve the Lord God. There is no other God. That's why when I started out, I said, Pharaoh said, Moses, God is God. Why? Because he saw the real God displayed. Remember when Moses threw down his, his rod and became a serpent and Pharaoh didn't bat an eye, called his soothsayers magicians. They threw down their rods. They became serpents. But see, God's word always wins out. The, the serpent that belonged to the rod of Moses opened its mouth and swallowed up all the other false serpents, all the other false doctrine, all the other false prophets. And it's going to happen again. It's going to, listen, I'm not at all afraid that Islam is going to take over the world. They want to. That is their mission. That is their objective. And in the Quran, if you read the Quran, it says they want to take it over if, uh, through violence if violence is necessary. And we're taking those people and electing them and putting them in the Congress and the Senate of the United States and wondering why our country is on the way to hell. It's because we're putting hellish people in the office that leads our country. We are on the wrong road, church. I'm talking about the country. We're on the wrong road. I pray for President Trump every day. He's the most hated man I know. 
He's the most hated man I know. I, I, I was talking to a Hispanic uh, maintenance guy at, at our apartment today. He had to come repair something. And I said, I'd just like to ask you something, being a, a Hispanic. Uh, what do you think about all this immigration and all this stuff that's going on? He said, well, I think Trump planned it all. <laughs> I said, well, he's a smart man, Eddie. I never knew he was that smart. But see, people want to blame somebody. We don't play the blame game. I'm going to tell you what's wrong with America, and it's not Trump. It's not President Trump. It's people who want their own way. They want to push God out of our government, push God out of our country. They don't want God dwelling in America anymore. We're talking about where does God dwell? He used to be welcome in America. He used to dwell here. That's why we have in God we trust on our money. That's why we pledge allegiance to one nation under God. That's why when you go back in the history of America, you found out we were founded on the word of God. The pilgrims came over here praying, seeking God. They wanted to find a country where they could be free to worship Jehovah. Not any God. Not Allah. But the God of the Bible, Jehovah God, Elohim, the real God, the only one true God. I know that just tears Oprah up. It makes people, you know, real upset when you say there's only one God, one true God. There's only one true church. There's only one truth. There's only one way. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, I am that way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to my Father except he come through me. Folks, that's, that's the gospel in a nutshell. I, I'm going to try to hurry here because I, I can see I'm going to run out of time. But listen, Pastor Don, Pastor Don went over time 15 minutes last week. I timed it just in case I was running short tonight. So, Pastor, if you're watching, start praying for me right now that I'll be able to wrap this thing up on time or not fudge too much. Let me, let, let me go to Psalm 16, verse 11. 16, verse 11, Psalm. He said, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Oh, what fellowship divine. I am his and he is mine. At the, at the, the right hand of God is pleasures forevermore. Fullness of joy in his presence. Hebrews 13, 5. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm going to go with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, my purpose when we started tonight was to show you that God's throne is in heaven. Earth is his footstool. Bring it right on down to show you, yes, God dwells in the heavens. God dwells in the earth. But actually, we're earth, aren't we? From the dust of what? The earth. God created man. So this is the earth God really wants to dwell in. If you're watching on this webcast, God wants to dwell in you. It was the Apostle Paul that came to this realization. Paul said, I live and I move and I have my existence, my being in God. I'm in God, he said. That's how I exist. I exist in God and God is in me. And then Paul again said, it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And so God dwelt in the Apostle Paul. God dwelt in the twelve. God dwelt in the early church. You can go all the way through the Bible and see that God's plan, his desire, uh, his, his passion was to live with his people and to live in his people. When Jesus got ready to go, he said, I must, there's a need for me to go away. Now, why would he say that? Here's Jesus, the miracle worker, the soul saver, the deliverer, uh, the, the very son of God. And he looks at his, his followers and said, there's a need for me to leave you. I must go away. He said, because if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. But if I go away, I will send him to you and he shall abide with you and be with you forever. Here is Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Remember we used to sing that, that chorus, A vessel of honor for God. A vessel of honor for God, sanctified, holy, that I might be a vessel of honor 
for God. God wants us to be his vessel. This clay pot, so to speak, that God puts on the potter's wheel and molds us and makes us and fashions us and knocks off the rough spots and knocks off the, the unlike Christ parts of us. We don't like that. It's, it's painful. It hurts. Uh, we sometimes complain about it. But, you know, he said, can the clay say to the potter? Can the clay tell the potter how to make it? No, let God have his way. Let God have his way in your life. I want God to have his way in me. And then, you know, remember when, uh, I believe it was Roberta Flack years ago, sang a song called Feelings. Whoa, feelings. Remember that? It wasn't a, a Christian song. <laughs> and I don't know, even know if she was a Christian. But I, I mention that because feelings have nothing to do with any of these scriptures I've been reading to you. Feelings really have nothing to do with your Christian life. Sorry to tell you that. Because we love to feel it. I do too. I love to feel it. You know, we used to sing, it gets down in my feet and it's keeping me alive. <laughs> the Holy Ghost and fire. And it's, I love to feel it. But you know, when I don't feel it, I have to react the same as if I do feel it. I can't let the enemy know that I'm walking by feelings because I'm not. I'm walking by faith. I'm walking knowing that he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you all the way even to the end of the world. So, you know, I think one of the most overrated uh, and undependable human traits is feelings. So don't go by your feelings. Go by the word of God. And I'm going to close right here with this thought and try to squeeze everything in here at the very end. So don't leave us yet because I, I want to talk to you for just a second before we leave the air. Uh, I mentioned this, I believe, a few weeks ago uh, when Pastor Don and I were talking, and I forget the subject we were talking about, but I talked about an old uh, song, an old hymn written by Hubert Buffum in 1922. And it appears in 35 of our hymn books, 35 hymnals. And the first verse says, I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk this narrow way. For the hand of God in all my life I see. And the reason for my bliss, yes, the secret all is this, that the comforter abides with me. Now what does abide mean? It means lives. He said, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, dwells in me. God's dwelling place is in his creation. Look around, you see it in the sun, moon, stars, as we've already covered. But look in the mirror and say, that's where God really wants to dwell. I am God's most desired dwelling place. And, and, and as we come to a conclusion of this webcast, I, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for those of you who would say, you know, Pastor Al, with all of my heart, I want God to dwell in me. I want God to dwell in me. I'm willing to pay whatever price. We sang a song when we traveled years ago called Whatever It Takes. For my will to break, Lord, that's what I'll be willing to do. One of the verses says, I'll trade sunshine for rain. Are you willing to make that trade if that's what it takes? I'll trade comfort for pain. Are you willing to make that trade? if that's what it takes to make you more like him. Uh, Lord, that's what I'll be willing to do. See, we want to dictate to God and tell him how to bless us, uh, how to do this, how to do that. God is God. And we, we've sung it for years. He's God on the platform. He's God back at the door. He's God in the amen corner. He's God all over the floor. God is God. And God don't ever change. God is God and he always will be God. Amen. He doesn't need our help, but he seeks it. He wants it. Isn't that something? God wants to live in you and me. God wants to think and give us his thoughts. God wants us to speak his words. That, that boggles my mind. And it makes me so thankful that God called me as a 15-year-old boy who didn't know God. My parents knew God. My brother knew God. Some of them were called in the ministry. I didn't know God, and I wasn't looking for him. But when I began to thirst, when I began to see that the things I was trying to, to have fulfill me were not fulfilling, 
Then I turned toward God and began to seek after God. It was young people and the youth camp where I went, all filled with the Holy Spirit, all speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I, saw, I didn't understand it, but I saw it. I witnessed it, and I witnessed their love for me. Me and one other boy ended up being the only two left unsaved in that entire youth camp. You talk about feeling lonely. <laughs> all those Holy Spirit-filled teenagers, and there I was trying to figure out a way, how can I get out of this camp and get back home where I can be comfortable and away from all these holy rolling kids? But I, I, I'm proud to say I didn't make it. I didn't make it. Uh, the Holy Spirit, I, I, I began to weep one night on the front row of the youth camp, crying like a baby. Uh, Pastor Taylor came down, I didn't know who she was then, put her hand on my shoulder, and she said, son, don't you want to be saved? Here's how ignorant I was, and I'd grown up in a Baptist church, in a Methodist church in my hometown. I said, uh, be what? She said, saved. I said, I don't know what that means. I didn't know what being saved was. 15 years old, grew up in a Methodist and Baptist church. But you know what I said? I said, look at all these other young people. I've watched them this whole week at youth camp. Uh, I'd like to have what they've got. I'd like to have what they've got. Don't tell me that the God in you is not contagious. Don't tell me that the God in you cannot turn somebody else toward God. That's how this works. It doesn't work because I'm going to preach a great sermon uh, or pastor is going to preach a great uh, series. It works when you begin to do what we've been teaching and telling people to do for over 50 years. Just grow up. Grow up and say, God, make me your dwelling place. I want you to dwell in me. I'm going to take a moment, just reach over here and get our prayer box. I know I disappeared. Look, I'm back. It's, it's magic. I wanted to, I know Pastor prayed over these Sunday, but I want you to look at this because uh, we invite you to send in your prayer request. And this box is covered with uh, the globe. Uh, I'm looking right now. It says Greenland, and here's Greenland over here. And, and uh, I see the... Uh, uh, the Greenland Sea. It's all about Greenland. I got to find, I know the world's, oh, there we are, South America, and there is Europe, and North America, and all the oceans. There's Nigeria, Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, the Philippines, uh, the, the uh, Chinese Republic. In all these places, we have the ability to reach through this webcast. And Pastor Don had a vision to begin Experience Life Church, actually. Uh, it was Grace Church when it began, and now it's changed its name to Experience Life Church, uh, where we want to make uh, the rest of your life the best of your life. That's kind of our slogan around here, making the rest of our life the best of our life. Uh, I'm 75 years old. I'll be 76 in a few days, a few months. Uh, my wife's already 76. Pastor Don's already 76. But Pastor Sheridan and I, we're lagging behind She's lagging behind more than anybody. You know. Well, no, David's actually lagging behind. But listen, the point is, whatever your age, whatever your status in life, God wants to dwell in you. He wants to dwell with you. He wants to dwell. See, Jesus dwelled with the people. But he said, I, I need to go away because I want to send the comforter and he can dwell in everybody. Jesus couldn't get into everybody because he was in a human body. He was limited to his body because he chose to be. But the Holy Spirit comes into us without limits. Isn't that amazing? Without limits. God lives in us without limits. Now, we're limited, but he's not. And so we say, Lord, I want you to dwell in me. If you are anywhere uh, on this globe, you want to send us your prayer request, we will drop it in this box like we have, like Pastor said Sunday. It's been getting really, really heavy. But... Send us your prayer requests, whatever it is, whatever the need is. And you can tune us at elglobal.church. That's, that's our, our own website. Uh, I know we're on live stream and Roku TV, and I can't name them all. Pastor knows them. I don't uh, have them memorized yet. But I know we're, we're not on just Facebook. We're on many different apps. And, and I don't know what app you're watching on, but send us your prayer requests. We will put it in this box. And interested people... People who love you will join Pastor and I praying over the needs in this box covered with the globe because we want to be a global church. And as I pray for those in, in our chapel here tonight and pray for those of you watching uh, by web, 
and over the internet. I want you to stretch your hand toward me and toward this box. Heavenly Father, we have given the word tonight because we want to see your people grow up. We, we want to see your people put on the whole armor of God. We want to see your people get dressed up in Jesus' clothes. And what I mean by that is we want his character. We want his nature. We want his mind. We want his thoughts. We want to be like him because your word said he was the first of many sons. The only begotten son, but because of him and through him, you want many sons and daughters of God. And so for those that are watching tonight that, that, that are saying with a sincere heart and a diligent spirit, God, come and dwell in me. Because see, when the Holy Spirit moves in, uh, doubts move out. Negativity moves out. The enemy moves out because there's not enough room for those things when Jesus comes into your heart to dwell in your heart. And we ask God to minister to you, to touch you wherever you are and bring you up and just consume you with a desire and a fervency to say, Lord, dwell in me. Dwell in me. Well, it's almost time to go, but before we do go, I want to say this. I want them to put up on the uh, screen the way you can give to this ministry. There it is right there. Actually, if you don't have a church, you can send your tithe right here to us. We use it uh, in a very uh, integral way. We, we don't just play around with God's money. Pastor Don is a very, uh, very much, he and Pastor Sharon, and this whole ministry, a ministry of integrity and honesty. And when we tell you we're going to do something, we do it. Right now, they're on a special mission. They're uh, looking at equipment that we may need, other things to upgrade this ministry. And everything costs money. Pastor mentioned Sunday, we have a new keyboard, a new set of drums. Why? Because the others wore, they, we say down south, they wore slap out. <laughs> we wore them slap out. And uh, so sometimes, you know, things wear out and you have to replace them. And one of these days, I'm going to replace this body with a new one. Or God's going to do it. And I'm excited about that. That's another subject for another night. But I want you to, to, to keep our pastors in prayer that they return safely. Uh, and, and Brother David in prayer that they all return safely. As I said, they're on a special mission uh, that involves upgrading this ministry because we want to have the very best so we can bring you the very best in gospel ministry. And uh, I think I said it before, but I'll repeat it. Uh, we are working feverishly right now to try to put enough content on elglobal.church so that we can have 24-7 uh, broadcasting, uh, telecasting actually, internet cast, whatever you want to call it. It's the same as television to me. If I turn it on and I get on uh, elglobal.church, I can watch uh, the service right here at Experience Life Church. And if you want to be a part of what we're doing, you can be a part. Now in a few days, Pastor Don and I have been talking uh, we're going to, to bring a subject to you that I want you to think seriously about. We, we're talking about sending the light of the gospel all around the world. And in order for us to do that, we need a lot of partners to do it. We cannot do it by ourselves. And so be praying about becoming a, a, a partner of sending the light. We're going to call it light bearers. A light bearer is like a candlestick. You put the candlestick on it, and the candle bears the light, but it has to have a bearer, a holder. And, and the Lord said, don't put it under a bushel. Put it on a candlestick or a light bearer and lift it up so it'll light the entire house. We want to light the whole world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I, I want to thank you. I want to take this moment before we leave you to thank you for partnering with this ministry. Some of you have done it for years. I've known Pastor Don for over 58 years. And so I know that his ministry is one of integrity and he's a real person. He, he's not a counterfeit. He doesn't put on. Uh, he and Pastor Sharon, uh, we, we don't want that. We want to bring you the real Jesus and the real gospel and the real deliverance that it brings to your life. So until we see you next Tuesday at uh, 7 Central Time or till we see you this Sunday here at 10.30 Central Time.